The Twelve Chairs by Ilf and Petrov. Chapter 37. The Green Cape. Engineer Bruns was sitting on the stone veranda of his little wooden house at the Green Cape under a large palm, the starched leaves of which cast narrow pointed shadows on the back of his shaven neck, his white shirt, and the ham's chair from Madame Popov's suite, on which the engineer was restlessly awaiting his dinner. Bruns pouted his thick, juicy lips and called in the voice of a petulant, chubby little boy, Moosey! The house was silent. The tropical flora fawned on the engineer. Cacti stretched out their spiky mittens towards him. Drachenia shrubs rustled their leaves. Banana trees and sago palms chased the flies from his face, and the roses with which the veranda was woven fell at his feet. But all in vain. Bruns was hungry. He glowered petulantly at the mother of Pearl Bay and the distant cape of Batumi, and called out in a sing-song voice, Moosey, Moosey! The sound quickly died away in the moist tropical sub-air. There was no answer. Bruns had visions of a large golden-brown goose with sizzling greasy skin, and unable to control himself, yelled out, Moosey, where's the goosey? Andrew Mikhailovich, said a woman's voice from inside, don't keep on at me. The engineer, who was already pouting his lips into the accustomed shape, promptly answered, Moosey, you haven't any pity for your little hobby. Get out, you glutton, came the reply from inside. The engineer did not give in, however. He was just about to continue his appeals for the goose, which had been going on unsuccessfully for two hours, when a sudden rustling made him turn round. From the black-green clumps of bamboo, there had emerged a man in torn blue tunic shirt, belted with a shabby twisted cord with tassels and frayed striped trousers. The stranger's kindly face was covered with ragged stubble. He was carrying his jacket in his hand. The man approached and asked in a pleasant voice, Where can I find Engineer Bruns? I'm Engineer Bruns, said the goose charmer in an unexpectedly deep voice. What can I do for you? The man silently fell to his knees. It was Father Theodore. Have you gone crazy? cried the engineer. Stand up, please. I won't, said Father Theodore, following the engineer with his head and gazing at him with bright eyes. Stand up. I won't. And careful so that it would not hurt, the priest began beating his head against the gravel. Moosey, come here, shouted the frightened engineer. Look what's happening. Please get up, I implore you. I won't, repeated Father Theodore. Moosey ran out onto the veranda. She was very good at interpreting her husband's intonation. Seeing the lady, Father Theodore promptly crawled over to her and, bowing to her feet, rattled off, On you, mother, on you, my dear, on you I lay my hopes. Engineer Bruns thereupon turned red in the face, seized the petitioner under the arms, and, straining hard, tried to lift him to his feet. Father Theodore was crafty, however, and tucked up his legs. The disgusted Bruns dragged his extraordinary visitor into a corner and forcibly sat him in a chair. A ham's chair, not from Vorobyaninov's house, but one belonging to General Popov's wife. I dare not sit in the presence of high-ranking persons, mumbled Father Theodore, throwing the baker's jacket which smelt of kerosene across his knees. And he made another attempt to go down on his knees. With a pitiful cry, the engineer restrained him by the shoulders. Moosey, he said, breathing heavily, talk to this citizen. There's been some misunderstanding. Moosey at once assumed a business-like tone. In my house, she said menacingly, kindly don't go down on anyone's knees. Dear lady, said Father Theodore humbly, mother. I'm not your mother. What do you want? The priest began burbling something incoherent, but apparently deeply moving. It was only after lengthy questioning that they were able to gather that he was asking them to do him a special favor and sell him the suite of twelve chairs, one of which he was sitting on at that moment. The engineer let go of Father Theodore with surprise, whereupon the latter immediately plumped down on his knees again and began creeping after the engineer like a tortoise. But why? cried the engineer, trying to dodge Father Theodore's long arms. Why should I sell my chairs? It's no use how much you go down on your knees like that. I just don't understand anything. But they're my chairs, groaned the Holy Father. What do you mean they're yours? How can they be yours? You're crazy. Mostly I see it all. This man's a crackpot. They're mine, repeated the priest in humiliation. Do you think I stole them from you then? asked the engineer furiously. Did I steal them? Mosey, this is blackmail. Oh, Lord, whispered Father Theodore. If I stole them from you, then take the matter to court, but don't cause pandemonium in my house. Did you hear that, Mosey? How impudent can you get? They don't even let a man have his dinner in peace. 
No, Father Theodore did not want to recover his chairs by taking the matter to court, by no means. He knew that Engineer Bruns had not stolen them from him, oh no, that was the last idea he had in his mind. But the chairs had nevertheless belonged to him before the revolution, and his wife, who was on her deathbed in Voronezh, was very attached to them. It was to comply with her wishes, and not in his own initiative, that he had taken the liberty of finding out the whereabouts of the chairs and coming to see Citizen Bruns. Father Theodore was not asking for charity, oh no. He was sufficiently well off. He owned a small candle factory in Samara to sweeten his wife's last few minutes by buying the old chairs. He was ready to splurge and pay twenty rubles for the whole set of chairs. What? cried the engineer, growing purple. Twenty rubles for a splendid drawing room suite? Moosey, did you hear that? He really is a nut. Honestly, he is. I'm not a nut, but merely complying with the wishes of my wife who sent me. Oh, hell, said the engineer. Moosey, he's at it again. He's crawling around again. Name your price, moaned Father Theodore, cautiously beating his head against the trunk of an oracaria. Don't spoil the tree, you crazy man. Moosey, I don't think he's a nut. He simply distorted his wife's illness. Shall we sell him the chairs and get rid of him? Otherwise, he'll crack his skull. And what are we going to sit on? asked Moosey. We'll buy some more. For twenty rubles? Suppose I don't sell them for twenty. Suppose I don't sell them for two hundred. But supposing I do sell them for two fifty. In response came the sound of a head against a tree. Moosey, I'm fed up with this. The engineer went over to Father Theodore with his mind made up and began issuing an ultimatum. First, move back from the palm at least three spaces. Second, stand up at once. Third, I'll sell you the chairs for two hundred and fifty and not a copic less. It's not for personal gain, chanted Father Theodore, but merely in compliance with my sick wife's wishes. Well, oh boy, my wife's also sick. That's right, isn't it, Moosey? Your lungs aren't in too good a state, are they? But on the strength of that, I'm not asking you to sell me your jacket for thirty kopecks. Howard for nothing, exclaimed Father Theodore. The engineer waved him aside in irritation and then said coldly, Stop your tricks. I'm not going to argue with you anymore. I've assessed the worth of the chairs at 250 rubles and I'm not shifting one cent. Fifty, offered the priest. Moosey, said the engineer, call Bagration, let him see this citizen off the premises. Not for personal gain, Bagration. Father Theodore fled in terror while the engineer went into the dining room and sat down to the goose. Bruns's favorite bird had a soothing effect on him. He began to calm down. Just as the engineer was about to pop a goose leg into his pink mouth, having first wrapped a piece of cigarette paper around the bone, the face of the priest appeared appealingly at the window. Not for personal gain, said a soft voice. Fifty-five rubles. The engineer let out a roar without turning around. Father Theodore disappeared. The whole of that day, Father Theodore's figure kept appearing at different points near the house. At one moment, it was seen coming out of the shade of the cryptomeria. At another, it rose from a mandarin grove. Then it raced across the backyard and, fluttering, dashed towards the botanical garden. The whole day, the engineer kept calling for Moosey, complaining about the crackpot and his own headache. From time to time, Father Theodore's voice could be heard echoing through the dust. A hundred and eight, he called from somewhere in the sky. A moment later, his voice came from the direction of Dumbasak's house. A hundred and forty-one, not for personal gain, Mr. Browns, but merely... At length, the engineer could stand it no longer. He came out onto the veranda and, peering into the darkness, began shouting very clearly, Damn you, two hundred rubles then, only leave us alone! There was a rustle of disturbed bamboo, the sound of a soft groan and fading footsteps, then all was quiet. Stars floundered in the bay. Fireflies chased after Father Theodore and circled round his head, casting a greenish medicinal glow on his face. Now the goose has flown, muttered the engineer, going inside. Meanwhile, Father Theodore was speeding along the coast in the last bus in the direction of Batumi. A slight surf washed right up to the side of him, the wind blew in his face, and the bus hooted in reply to the whining jackals. That evening, Father Theodore sent a telegram to his wife in the town of N. Goods found, stop, wire me, 230, stop, sell anything, stop, Theo. For two days, he loafed around elatedly near Bruns's house, bowing to Moosey in the distance and even making the tropical distances resound with shouts of, Not for personal gain, but merely at the wishes of my wife who sent me. Two days later, the money was received, together with a desperate telegram. Sold everything, stop, not a cent left, stop, kisses and am waiting, stop, Evstigneev still having meals, stop, Katie. Father Theodore counted the money, crossed himself frenziedly, hired a cart, and drove to the Green Cape. 
the weather was dull. A wind from the Turkish frontier blew across the thunderclouds. The strip of blue sky became narrower and narrower. The wind was near gale force. It was forbidden to take boats to sea and to bathe. Thunder rumbled above Batumi. The gale shook the coast. Reaching Brunz's house, the priest ordered the Adjar driver to wait and went to fetch the furniture. I've brought the money, said Father Theodore. You ought to lower your price a bit. Moosey, groaned the engineer. I can't stand any more of this. No, no, I've brought the money, said Father Theodore hastily. Two hundred, as you said. Moosey, take the money and give him the chairs and let's get it over with. I've a headache. His life ambition was achieved. The candle factory in Samara was falling into his lap. The jewels were pouring into his pocket like seeds. Twelve chairs were loaded into the cart one after another. They were very like Vora Bianinov's chairs, except that the covering was not flowered chintz, but rep with blue and pink stripes. Father Theodore was overcome with impatience. Under his shirt, behind a twisted cord, he had tucked a hatchet. He sat next to the driver and, constantly looking round at the chairs, drove to Batumi. The spirited horses carried the Holy Father and his treasure down along the highway past the finale restaurant, where the wind swept across the bamboo tables and arbors, past the tunnel that was swallowing up the last few tank cars of an oil train, past the photographer deprived that overcast day of his usual clientele, past a sign reading, Batumi Botanic garden, and carried him not too quickly along the very line of surf. At the point where the road touched the rocks, Father Theodore was soaked with salty spray. Rebuffed by the rocks, the waves turned into water spouts and, rising up to the sky, slowly fell back again. The jolting and the spray from the surf whipped Father Theodore's troubled spirit into a frenzy. Struggling against the wind, the horses slowly approached Mokdin Jory. From every side, the turbid green waters hissed and swelled. Right up to Batumi, the white surf swished like the edge of a petticoat peeking from under the skirt of a slovenly woman. Stop, Father Theodore suddenly ordered the driver. Stop, Mohammedan. Trembling and stumbling, he started to unload the chairs onto the deserted shore. The apathetic Ajar received his five rubles, whipped up the horses, and rode off. Making sure there was no one about, Father Theodore carried the chairs down from the rocks onto a dry patch of sand and took out his hatchet. For a moment, he hesitated, not knowing where to start. Then, like a man walking in his sleep, he went over to the third chair and struck the back a ferocious blow with the hatchet. The chair toppled over, undamaged. Aha! shouted Father Theodore. I'll show you! And he flung himself onto the chair as though it had been a live animal. In a trice, the chair had been hacked to ribbons. Father Theodore could not hear the sound of the hatchet against the wood cloth covering and springs. All sounds were drowned out by the powerful roar of the gale. Aha! 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 cried the priest, swinging from the shoulder. One by one, the chairs were put out of action. Father Theodore's fury increased more and more. So did the fury of the gale. Some of the waves came up to his feet. From Batumi to Sinop, there was a great din. The sea raged and vented its spite on every little ship. The SS Lenin sailed towards Novorossik with its two funnels smoking and its stern plunging low in the water. The gale roared across the Black Sea, hurling thousand-ton breakers onto the shore of Trebiznod, Yalta, Odessa, and Kostanska. Beyond the still and the Bosporus and the Dardanelles surged the Mediterranean. Beyond the Straits of Gibraltar, the Atlantic smashed against the shores of Europe. A belt of angry water encircled the world. And on the Batumi shore stood Father Theodore, bathed in sweat and hacking at the final chair. A moment later, it was all over. Desperation seized him. With a dazed look at the mountain of legs, backs, and springs, he turned back. The water grabbed him by the feet. He lurched forward and ran soaked to the road. A huge wave broke on the spot where he had been a moment before and, swirling back, washed away the mutilated furniture. Father Theodore no longer saw anything. He staggered along the road, hunched and hugging his fist to his chest. He went into Batumi, unable to see anything about him. His position was the most terrible thing of all. Three thousand miles from home and twenty rubles in his pocket, getting home was definitely out of the question. Father Theodore passed the Turkish bazaar where he was advised in a perfect stage whisper to buy some Cody powder, silk stockings, and contraband Batumi tobacco, dragged himself to the station, and lost himself in the crowd of porters.